Good afternoon, and uh, it's such a joy to welcome you to this second webinar of the Nane Nane series. Um, this is a series that comes to you, hosted by Inuka Nisisi, and we're really, really happy to be able to uh, build on the momentum of Saba Saba that um, so we started this journey last month. Um, as we reflect on how far we have come as a nation and how much we need to do going forward. And of course, this month, we are all celebrating 10 years since we promulgated the constitution. And I know that there's a whole mix of feelings. Some people feel, well, nothing has really happened. Some people are frustrated. Some people have lost the excitement that we once had. But as we really reflect on what it is that we have achieved, and we have achieved a lot in the last 10 years, I think this is a webinar series that will help us ground us in terms of looking back at the journey we have come, but also getting us all fired up again about the work that we have the privilege to do in the present times as we think about the future. Um, yesterday, uh, Jedi Dawarohio led us in an amazing um, reflection on human rights and nationhood, very ably moderated by Hussein Khalid. Um, and if you missed that, please go and look for it on the Nisisi Kenya YouTube. For me, it was something I actually listened to twice because it was really deep. It really grounded um, not just this series, but this conversation in particular. And I'm really, really grateful to both Jedida and, 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 and Hussein for starting us off on such an amazingly wonderful note. And so today we're going to be talking about culture as the foundation of the nation. Um, which is Article 11 of the Constitution. I know many times when I, I point out to people that the Constitution actually says that the foundation, not a foundation, but the foundation of the nation is culture, I often get two reactions. One reaction is people who just say like, what? How come I've never seen that in the Constitution? Let me go and check it out. And then the other is people who say, ah, those are just words. I mean, what does it really mean? when we say culture is the foundation of the nation. It sounds like these, these words are really nice words to say, but nobody really knows what it means. Nobody knows how do we translate that into our lived experience. It just becomes something that we like to say when we say we are a nation of diverse identities. So today we thought that we would actually think through what does it mean when Article 11 of the Constitution emphasizes that out of all the many things we could have said. We could have said land is the foundation of this nation and the people who think it is. We could have said um, human rights are the foundation of this nation. We could have said many things are the foundation of the nation. What does it mean when Article 11 of the Constitution says, and I quote, the Constitution recognizes culture as the foundation of the nation and as the cumulative civilization of the Kenyan people and nation. And then of course, Article 11 goes on to talk about the responsibilities of the state or some of the responsibilities of the state with regard to this, and also the responsibilities of the people's representatives who are parliament. This, you know, if some of you may have remembered even this Madaraka day in, the, in his address to the head, to the nation, the head of state actually said, and I quote, Culture is at the core of reimagining a national dream. So like I said, these are words that we know. I don't think anybody disputes it. The question is, what does it mean? And if we're going to be talking about constantly this responsibility to reimagine the nation, constantly this responsibility, as Article 3 tells us, to uphold, to defend, um, and, and to do everything we can with the Constitution, then the question is, do we understand what that means? I couldn't think of a better person to, to lead us and to catalyze our thinking on this or to help us reflect deeper into our responsibilities as um, we get to the 10th um, anniversary of the promulgation of the constitution than Abu Bakr Zain Abu Bakr. Um, Abu Bakr Zain has asked that we, I introduce him simply as a Kenyan storyteller. And indeed, you will see that what we will be doing today is going back and, 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 and celebrating the gift that we have in stories and how stories can help us think through these deep things. So we'll be telling a lot of stories today, but more importantly, 
um, he also wants us to remember that he's not just a storyteller, but a storyteller who at the core of what he does, remembers that it is about being Kenyan in all the various um, ways that this means. Kenyan has to do with this nation, but also our responsibilities within the world. Um, Zain uh, started out, uh, so many people might remember, some people might remember this. Um, his roots are very deep in, 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 in the cultural sphere, in doing cultural work. He was one of the um, co-leaders of the Nairobi Theatre Academy after leaving um, university where he was at Kenyatta University, where I had the pleasure of spending a lot of time beginning to um, work through these questions. Um, he's currently completing a master's in peace education. Um, but many of us would actually know Zane from his extensive work in the fields of policy and legislation. He served at the East African Legislative Assembly as a member representing Kenya. And then he also spent substantive amount of time at Uraia Trust as the executive director, and more recently, um, leading Muhuri. Um, but I think where we're going to spend the core of our time today is really reflecting on the work that Zane did as a commissioner with first the People's Commission of Kenya and then the Constitution of Kenya Review Commission, where he was amongst those who really worked to, to, to bring um, the question of culture to the forefront of the Constitution and also to what we do as a nation. So. Um, as I welcome Zane, I just want to say how much we're really, I'm personally really looking forward to this. Uh, we will use, just as a, a couple of housekeeping, we will structure this, um, as I said, using stories. And we're going to structure this in three parts. We'll start with reflecting on the past, where we have come from, understanding what culture means, understanding how we got from, from you know, where we began to where we are today. We will look extensively at what the constitution has to say about culture. And then we will begin to um, reflect on where we need to go uh, within the present, but also towards the future. In between, I will be taking questions. So I encourage you, if you are on the Zoom webinar, please use the question and answer um, function. Feel free to keep chatting on the chat, but I'm going to request that you put your questions in the Q&A so that we're able to bring them up as we go along. And if you are on YouTube, feel free to put your questions on the comment um, um, section of YouTube, and we will be harvesting those questions so that we can, we can bring them um, to Zane. And so I'm going to go just jump straight into it. Thank you very much for joining us. Karibu, karibu, karibu sana Zane. Um, and I want to just start it off, first of all, by welcoming you. And then do you want to say anything before I ask you, actually, what are we talking about? Because I'm really, I'm really interested in knowing what do we mean when we say culture? But first, Karibu. Thank, thank you very much. And um, thank you for your kind and generous uh, introduction. But also, um, thank you, um, Inukani uh, Nisisi, for um, bringing us together so that we can have a conversation as Kenyans, as um, Africans, as global citizens. Um, on matters that are very important to us. So I'm, I'm very, very um, happy to be with you today. Um, thank you very, very much, Zain. And I just wanted to start by asking, let's, let's first just set the grounds of the conversation. When we say culture, what do we mean? I think there are very many definitions out there. And yesterday I was very happy to hear Commissioner Jijida talk about the importance of culture as, an, as a tool. Um, and talking about what does it mean when we talk about a culture of integrity. I've referenced um, what the president said at the Madaraka Day speech. Some people say, okay, this is about the arts. Some people say this is about heritage. So let's just get our terms. I know we will talk about what the constitution says, but when we use the term culture, what are you thinking about? Okay, um, you, you, the, the concept of culture is, um, obviously um, a contested um, concept, but uh, there are certain attributes that people agree um, as to what it constitutes. You know, um, if you go very way back, um, you will know that the sources of the word culture comes from um, uh, Latin origins in terms of cultivation. And, and uh, at, at, at that time, people were thinking of cultivation and refinement of mannerisms, 
physical attributes, uh, social attributes, and so on. But I think in, in, in our context, um, it is important for us um, to consider um, one of the first few scholars who um, uh, articulated what they thought was uh, culture was called Edward B. Taylor. Um, and he published um, an interesting book called Primitive Culture, uh, 1871. And then uh, this was reprinted in 1958. And Taylor say, says that culture is, um, was a complex whole, which includes knowledge, belief, art, morals, law, customs, and any other capabilities and habits acquired by man as a member of society. And uh, mind the language that he's using, uh, that he wrote this in 1871. But uh, to many um, African scholars, and um, uh, we make a lot of references to Kenyan scholars, they have um, articulated various ideas about culture. So if you start with, um, with the number of scholars that I will refer to, what is common to them is that um, it is a, a complex continuum it is about life. Culture is about um, how people ad adapt and adopt to their environment, how they ne negotiate rules of belonging, rules of living together, how they cope with their environment. So it is a sum total of um, all aspects of what life is. So it is a way of life. And um, if you consider, for example, um, Bethel Ogot, looking at it from a historical perspective, he makes the very interesting um, remarks concerning uh, communities of people who have a sense of kinship, who have a sense of uh, common history, who have a sense of common traditions, who have a sense of belonging, and who have a sense of being rooted in the environment under which they find themselves. But what I find very interesting about Ogot's um, ideas about culture is that um, Bethel Ogot talks about culture is not um, um, purist in its approach, at least within the context of African culture and Kenyan culture for that matter. And he produces evidence that before the arrival of um, Europeans to our land, people considered culture to be something evolving. And there were no exclusive um, identities the way we understand them now. And he gave examples of how the Maasai were interacting with the Kikuyu. And in, in many times, you would not draw any distinctions, except when there is uh, possibly war or there's tension between uh, various sections of society. He gave examples of communities in the coast, in Western Kenya, in Rift Valley. And the idea of identity was always continually negotiated. So that is what I, I take um, uh, from uh, Professor God. Um, if you talk about um, Professor, for example, um, Tabitha Karogo, who is an educationist, her work mostly was looking at how colonialism impacted on African culture and specifically women. And more recently, she's gotten into how it impacts on um, on children and um, uh, what is common to tabitha and uh, ogot is that they start from the premise that um, africans had civilizations before the coming of the european and this is consistent in many of the scholars if you talk about what ngugi talks about or ali mazrui or um michelle mugo or Chesaina Serunji. I, I can go on and on and talk about Wangare Madai, looking at it from an environmentalist point of view, 
um, and how communities created harmony with the environment. Um, and, and the lack of tension made the environment survive and thrive. And where there is tension, then um, people will suffer if they do not create harmony between them and the environment. So in a sense, and in a nutshell, we can say culture is the sum total of all facets of life. And uh, if you look at uh, what uh, Professor Osaga Odak or uh, the late Mbiti uh, talked about, from them, uh, Osaga Odak, who was an anthropologist, draws a distinction that culture is also about cosmology. In other words, creating a sense of belonging in the context of a finite existence in an infinite universe. Meaning what? Meaning that communities and groups of people will have an idea of explaining the difficult questions of life. For example, where were you before you were born? For example, why are you here? What are you doing on this earth? For example, what will happen to you when you die? So these explanations of these questions that define that you have a finite existence, that you are, there's a day you are born and there's a day you, are, you will die, but the universe is endless. And um, people wanting to participate in this endless universe, then they come up with explanations that then later on through repetition, through passing on from one generation to another, then they become traditions, they become mores, they become a way of life, they become lifestyles, they become fashion, they become custom. So let me finish by saying the following. In the two things which are very critical. One, before the interruption of um, African traditions, African cultures, African civilizations. Um, there was advancement in many areas, in science, in medicine, in agriculture, in um, maritime science. Uh, a number of our societies were maritime societies. In other words, they, 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 they had already conquered the seas and they could um, be defined by today's terminology that they were global trotters. In other words, they could go to far away lands and come back and uh, exchange. And in this exchange, it included culture. So interactions between different peoples and different cultures enhances um, and make the culture grow. So in a, in a sense, all this um, uh, uh, scholars have made reference to agree that culture is dynamic. Culture is not static. Culture is not uh, something that is cast in stone. There are some, some things you give up, some new things you learn, and some new traditions um, grow, and people adopt new things. Um, the other thing that is um, critical is that the process of um, locating African culture became prob problematic uh, when the European arrived um, in our continent and in Kenya in, in, sp in specific terms. And this is based on this um, great idea people talk about, which became very oppressive, the doctrine of discovery. And they, they said they have to discover people. And when they were discovering people, some of them came here and found that people are very advanced. The societies were advanced, the cultures were advanced. In other words, they had thriving civilizations. Um, so, of course, there was denial that uh, there was civilization, there was culture, because you could not then oppress or become overlords of a people who are already civilized. Because they, the cover of oppression and exploitation was um, uh, took the, the face of a civilizing mission. You, you can only civilize those who are uncivilized. You can only give culture to those who are uncultured. So it became problematic because um, many people were then um, indoctrinated to believe that um, our cultural development began with the arrival of the other. 
and uh, some people have bought into this um, indoctrination and and it has created um, dilemmas for them and contradictions in their lives so um, to many of us who are in the field of culture we believe that um, coming to terms with all all aspects of our of our lives is important and if culture then is understood to mean all these things about life then um, you cannot um, again say and say you cannot actually start debating is it the foundation of a nation or not the, then the answer becomes obvious but i would like to stop there Wow, you've said so many things in, and I think among the things that's really important is this really broad um, space that culture occupies so that it's not just arts, it's not just heritage, it's not just the expression of one person's identity or group of people's identity. It really is all these things all coming together. And I also really like the point that you made that culture is dynamic. And so it's not just something we inherit. And then people say our traditions do not allow us to do something or it's not something that we say, well, this, this, you know, we have always done this, but it's something that we can do something about. In fact, as you were speaking, I was reminded by what Franz Vanon said, which is um, when he talked about a national culture and he said a national culture is the whole body of efforts made by a people in the sphere of thought to describe, justify and praise the action through which that people has created itself and keeps itself in existence. Which leads me to my next question, that when we talk about a national culture and we talk about culture in the constitution, we are talking about all the many different um, cultures of the different identities of who we are as, as, as Kenyan peoples. But we're yes. also talking about this really deliberate and conscious um, effort, this journey that we have taken to, to, to to create, to make, um, to, to say, who are, we as a, who are we as a nation? Who do we want to be? Who do we want to become? What is it that when we, we envision ourselves as becoming? And so I want to go straight to that journey. I know you were very intimately um, tied into the journey. So I wonder if you could just very quickly um, take us through where it started, the journey of entrenching and putting culture in the constitution. Um, how did it begin? Did it begin? I know you are a member of the People's Commission of Kenya. I know you are a member of the CKRC. Perhaps let's just take the next um, 10 minutes to reflect on that journey. How did we get to the point where this became part of our constitution? Um, uh, let, let me first affirm what you said, and I've seen uh, the comments by my brother, Obi Obi Rodiambo. I In no way did I start saying uh, there's one African culture. There's, there's no such thing. Um, I think uh, we will come to how do you engineer a national culture, but um, all communities have the same potential of developing their own cultural um, um, dimension. But let's start with, uh, with Kenya as, as, as a concept. Of course, um, by the time the, the colonial um, government had taken over uh, our country, by the time we were fighting for independence, by the time there was consideration that Kenya should become independent, there's a possibility that Kenya should become um, independent at some point. Uh, we had three distinct regions or three distinct entities under the British um, influence. Uh, we had the Kenya colony, which most of the people know. We had uh, what was called the Kenya protectorate, which was mainly um, what you may say is uh, the coastal strip, and we had the northern frontier district. So when discussions came about about how do you create um, an independent nation, how uh, we did not become a nation by choice. Um, people were brought together by many, in many cases by force, and of course today is not the time for us to spend time in in terms of saying, um, talking about the, 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 the impact of the Berlin Conference and, and creating boundaries and so on and so forth. But when we started negotiating, um, the British did not think it was important to have culture on the table of discussions for independence. Neither did they think it was important 
in the constitution making process there. So if you look at the process that um, uh, led to the negotiations for the adoption of the independence constitution, um, first of all, those negotiations were not done in Kenya. So they were done outside the, the context of Kenya or African soil. They were done in Europe. They were done in um, Lancaster House. And there were three distinct um, conferences. So in terms of setting, that was a setting. But secondly, the discussion mainly focused on how can you live together and you have very many dif distinct communities, distinct cultures, and, um, and distinct regions. So how can you live together? And the answer to that for the British was to uh, make proposals based on British history, British traditions, pre British institutions, British law, and British governance structures. And really, in the African context, most of the African uh, countries that got independence negotiated their independence and ended up adopting wholesomely um, ideas from the so-called mother country. In other words, the, the colonial power. So if you look at the British uh, colonies, many of them inherited what uh, later on people um, commented and called the Westminster model. Um, and they were referring to the, to the uh, prime ministerial system with, with, with um, um, the queen as head of state and the prime minister one who is first among equals leading a cabinet. But um, what people fail to understand and people uh, readily um, uh, talk about is that this constitutional uh, framework from um, Britain was inspired by British culture. Um, so if you, if you go back to founding documentations, for example, the Magna Carta, these were negotiations between sections of the community. And Magna Carta, in the meaning of the Great Agreement, is the well-known. Within the Great Agreement, there was a minor agreement, which is, which is called um, the Forest Agreement. There you'll find a lot more interests of common people there in the, in the forest agreement, because it was much more about people, ordinary people, if you like. In the Magna Carta, it was much more of class and, and class interest. So when we negotiated in the end, they um, more or less gave us a template, which was to use, which they had used for a long time, with a few tweaking here and there. Secondly, when people went to, to negotiate this um, constitutional framework, they were deemed to be representatives of the people. But there were no consultations with the people as to what needed to be negotiated. So in the end, after the final one to, first, to move fast, after the final agreement um, that led to independence, we ended up with the Westminster model, but we ended up with a constitution that had no reference to communities with one exception. The, the constitution was based on individual rights. It did not, in that sense, when you talk about individuals, you don't talk about culture. It is about individuals. Culture is about communities. Culture is about a sense of belonging. Culture is about social interaction. The 1963 constitution was based on individual rights. The only place where it deals with the quest of community rights are only two places. One, in, in relation to um, those who profess the Muslim faith. And um, once people admitted that the system that was colonial and that and the new system that was being proposed was mainly Judeo-Christian in traditions, they said, okay, we will accommodate Muslims to ensure that they are able to practice their faith and their way of life. And that was the compromise to allow the NFD, large part of NFD, and large part of cost, 
to be integrated into the main domain called Kenya and con constructing now an, a new country called Kenya. Now, given that it was mainly individual rights, um, you couldn't have found any references to community. So the second component that had close to community was how do you deal with the question of what, what was later on to be called trust land. This trust land uh, question was mainly land belonging to certain communities that the monarch um, said that these communities are not advanced enough to look properly after this land that the monarch will look after this land on behalf of these communities as a trustee. And of course, they did whatever they pleased with the land under that jurisdiction. But if you understand that the connection, that power of the monarch was then transferred to the prime minister. And then later on, the power of the prime minister was transferred to the president. But the assumption was still there that these are backward people who cannot care, take care of themselves. They only have the right of occupation, not ownership. And they needed to be guided as children and to be helped to manage their own affairs and their own land. So the closest to come to this is those two components. OK, so that's the basis of the constitution that we. Uh, your, your mic is off, doc, doctor. It's actually I can't off. hear you. Okay. You can't hear you. OK. Now I can hear you. Okay, that's the basis, therefore, of the, of the constitution that we were given or inherited or whatever you want to call it in 1963. So fast track, and we want to now um, give ourselves, as the preamble says, a new constitution, a new agreement, a new covenant based on who we are as the peoples of Kenya. Could you walk us through that process? Okay, so um, again, in summary form, people started agitating for a new constitutional order um, after, after, of course, uh, the 1963 constitution was um, um, mutilated and uh, we transformed ourselves into a single party dictatorship. And people started agitating for the reintroduction of multipartism and, and the transformation of our constitution. And at that point, uh, discussions um, were begun in terms of saying, what kind of constitution do we need? So you could, you could trace back to the movement of Kenya to Itakayo, model constitution. Um, and, and also, people are very concerned about process. And they said, this time we must have a participatory process, a process that involves the majority of our people, a process that allowed for meaningful participation of these people, a process that allowed for all people to come um, in, 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 in a voluntary process to have a long discussion about how do we want to become a nation and what kind of constitution will we bequeath to ourselves in, that, in terms of that process. What is important in terms of that discussion is that clearly people wanted a participatory process, a process that involved um, all Kenyans, but also we negotiated values for that process. And in, among those values, there was um, value of meaningful participation of the people, values of respect for the people, values of negotiations and consensus building. And some of these values that I'm referring to ended up becoming values in our constitution. So what, what was critical about this process was that um, there was, um, of course, a dilemma. And, and there was a dispute. And uh, in summary form, there were two schools of thought. There was one school of thought that wanted to have experts to lead this process and come up with a, a constitution. And there were others like ourselves who wanted a people-driven or people-centered constitution-making process. And the first process, um, was the first opportunity of meaningful dialogue among Kenyans on what it means to be a Kenyan. Where are we coming from? What is our history? How would we want to change? How would we like to have commitments that will allow us to live together? 
how do we become a nation? And this, um, this school of thought, of course, won the day. Um, it was at that time those who were propagating for a, an expert-led, um, and people will recall Mze Moy saying, um, uh, how can an ordinary Kenyan uh, make a constitution? This is a joke. How can Wanjiku, and she was, he was giving an example, how can Wanjiku be asked to make a constitution? What does Wanjiku know? And this is where the concept of Wanjiku comes from. And people said, no, we, we will do it. There are ways of us doing it. But in, in a nutshell, the participatory approach won the day. And we then enacted, after long, long discussions, after making false starts after another, we then made a, a law that allowed us to have a participatory process. It is also important to note that um, every time we make pro progress, people will take us back a few steps. And that's why at some point there was conflict in the country and there was then those who wanted to go on with the review process and another group went to Fungamano and formed the People's Commission. But later on, the, the two processes merged into one and we ended up coming up with one of the most participatory process in the world and um, came up with tools and ways and means of translating ordinary Kenyans' lives into constitutional principles. And um, what is also important, some of the things were, that were done in terms of managing that process became um, minimum in terms of what participation means. For example, for the first time, we agreed that any Kenyan could come and make presentations to the review process, either in English or Kiswahili or any other Kenyan language, including sign language. Again, that became part of the constitution that it is in the constitution now. We also agreed that um, we will then um, capture what people are saying based again on Kenyan history, where people will collect views and then um, not pay attention to them and uh, come up with their own proposals. We agreed to record verbatim, audio visual, every presentation, every uh, handover of a memorandum and the verbal presentation. And the sittings were done in every constituency. And there were um, um, civic education that was undertaken so that people understood each and every step of the process and they meaningfully were able to give their views concerning um, what they want in their own constitution. So in terms of process, these are some of the dy dynamics. If you compare that with the constitution making process that led to independence, you will see that the people are not involved. In this context, the people are involved. So three quick things that are important in, in, in uh, addressing this. It is the people themselves who wanted culture to be a central um, um, architectural design of the constitution. It's the people themselves. So um, then it is not shocking to find that based on the views of the people and the architecture of our constitution, Article 1 of our constitution is the sovereignty of the people. So again, uh, recognizing who is sovereign. But it's the people themselves who say that. If people have an opportunity and they say it, then that's what they say. It's not, it's not the, the, the leader or the president who is sovereign. It's not parliament which is sovereign. It's not the judiciary that is sovereign. It's the people who are sovereign. And the sovereign power of the people can be exercised directly or through democratically elected representatives. Now, that, that idea of putting faith in the people is part of that cultural imperative. Secondly, that we mainstream some of these cultural ideas. They are mainstream. They are to be found throughout the constitution. And then um, thirdly, in the end, the, after a large struggle, and some people had to go to court and uh, to demonstrate, but in the end, we agreed that whatever would be proposed will have to get the consent of the people through a referendum. So again, 
the people put their own stamp on the outcome and say, this is what we told people. We didn't get everything. We understand this is a negotiated uh, document. And there were many competing interests, but we build consensus on holistically what will take us forward as a nation. And that's what became the constitution after the full start again of um, the rejected um, draft, but that's another story. We, we may get into it or not. But in the end, what is critical in this is that many of the cultural ideas in this constitution came from the people themselves. Thank you very much. That's, that's really a lot to chew on. And I do want to go to a couple of questions that have come up um, and, and take that before we, we, we go on. And I, then I would like to, you to take us into what you have said, that a lot of these imperatives have been captured in the Constitution. Before we do that, um, you've alluded to it, and I do want to take that step back. I know we had several drafts of the Constitution, and you have spoken about the process, especially that produced the zero draft um, that, that CKRC then put in front of the BOMAS um, conference. And, and I think an interesting thing happened at BOMAS, right? Um, and I wonder if you could talk to us about um, if I recall, and please correct me, you're the expert on this, that the CKRC draft or the zero draft did not have culture um, so closely intertwined and embedded in it. And then the BOMAS draft did. And I wonder if you could just walk us through that and then what happened subsequently. And I know we don't have much time, but if you could just give us a summary of that, and then we'll take some questions and then come back to really looking at how then, apart from Article 11, and you've begun already to speak a little bit about this, how then is culture at the heart of the constitution that we have today? Okay, so um, let me start first by saying that um, uh, what, what, is, what is interesting is that um, in terms of um, participation, um, when, when we did the, it, it wasn't actually zero draft, it was a proper CKR draft that was published in accordance to the law. But when we were, we were now analyzing, you know, the process of collecting views is one. Collecting views now, how do you bring them together, is another. And then drafting the constitution is another. The first um, uh, hurdle, of course, was um, at, the, at, at the drafting stage. No one disagreed that Kenyans had many um, ideas touching on culture. Um, at the design of, of the constitution and the drafting, it became a, a bit problematic because the majority of those who are trained, legal, legally trained uh, in, the, in the British system could not see where, where would you put culture? How do you put culture in a constitution? Um, and to them, culture was such a vague idea that you could not put in the constitution. So it was an uphill task in terms of um, the drafting part. Although we had a very um, amazing um, uh, expert um, uh, attached to the Kenyan team, uh, Professor Krab from Ghana. Professor Krab from Ghana was um, a celebrated um, legal scholar. Um, uh, in the continent and outside, in the Commonwealth as well, and and an expert um, uh, drafts um, man, that's the term, um, and he taught many of the people who are involved in drafting, legal drafting, um, across the Commonwealth, um, from from Great Britain to the West Indies uh, to the continent and so on. The good, good thing about that old man, God bless his soul, was that he was also a griot. He was also a master storyteller and, and a keeper of his people's memory. And he was an expert on the stories of Anansi um, uh, in the Ghanaian context. So he said, yes, it can be done. Let's try and do. The second hurdle became some of the commissioners who were also trained in the legal way, some, not all who are also saying, no, 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 uh, we don't want to do those kind of experiments. So in a nutshell, the CKRC draft did not have adequate um, cultural input. The closest there was to a broad cultural input was um, 
the establishment of a chapter called Directive Principles of State Policy. And in there, there were some ideas of values. Not, not, not all of them, but ideas of values that have um, cultural um, implications. But when we went to BOMAS, um, that is the national conference, because people say BOMAS, but technically, it, BOMAS just meant the Constitutional National Conference. And the delegates to the conference felt that it was a good draft, but there were two areas that needed the major rethinking and major um, uh, rewriting. And that is on culture and on devolution. And, um, and um, the, the, the conference then, in its wisdom, established two ad hoc committees, one on devolution and one on culture. And the one on culture, um, the convener was the last uh, Professor Wangari Madai, uh, who was uh, ably assisted by the late uh, Nakitare, who was a former director of culture. And it had uh, attracted um, interest on cultural proponents, but also people who are opposed to culture, uh, some religious leaders, uh, some women groups, and, and also some representation from persons with disability, because they said, in our culture, given the context of our culture, we have some very oppressive traditions concerning women and concerning persons with disability. And some of the clergy were worried about um, uh, opening up um, space for African religions and, uh, and maybe the demonization of um, other religions that people consider they came from outside the continent. But in the end, we arrived at a consensus that given that culture is dynamic, it's progressive, there are some ideas that can be adopted and some ideas that can be outlawed if they are oppressive or discriminatory, but all inclusive. Because again, we recognize that Kenyans are not from one culture. There are many communities in Kenya and many cultures in Kenya. And what people are referring to as African culture, sometimes it's a, a summarization of patterns in terms of looking at different communities. So we, we agreed that given that nature, we will recognize principles and values, and we will recognize all communities, but we will also provide a, a, a lenses that transcended the individual rights approach from the British in 1963. So if you look at our constitution, it has a place of the individual, it has a place for the family, it has a place for the community, and it has a place for the nation. And hopefully that the values that are then inculcated in the constitution will be used as a foundation of building a national culture. So all four um, dimensions are covered. So we have, we have moved away from just individual rights to family, to community, to national. And that um, Kenyans should be free to partake in a culture of their, of their choice. No one should be forced to partake in a particular culture. It is a, a free um, will of individuals to partake in whatever cultural um, life that they want um, to take part in. So uh, based on those recommendations, of course, the position of culture was enhanced. And we not only mainstreamed uh, culture throughout the constitution, but we also had a specific chapter dedicated to, um, to culture. And then there was also a specific chapter dedicated to values. So both, if you read both of them, so there are three dimensions, a, uh, a chapter on values, a chapter on culture, and then the mainstreaming of cultural principles and values across the constitution. So this is what came out of the of, uh, in the discussion in Bomas, and then we do know that um, we lost some of that um, when 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 um, in the Waco draft and subsequently. Um, and I don't know if you want to say anything about that, or may I should I go? Can yeah, I go to quick, the quickly? It is important to say it that um, after the Bomas draft, 
um, included all that. Um, politicians met with their advisors, mainly British trained um, lawyers or lawyers trained in British system in Naivasha. And one of the casualty of the negotiations was to remove the chapter on culture and to remove a large chunk of the chapter on uh, values. Um, the <clears throat> proposed uh, constitution of 2005, uh, popularly known as uh, Waco Draft, <clears throat> removed all that. So after it was rejected and the committee of experts were appointed, in the Harmonas Draft, limited aspects of that were returned, including a shorter version of the culture chapter. But again, after the harmonized draft was debated, again, the technical people removed uh, the, the chapter again, and uh, it, we ended up with the proposed constitution of 2010, which has um, that famous Article 11 and a few others. But um, luckily, many of the conceptualization principles and values which were then um, mainstreamed in other chapters across the constitution um, were left intact. So those ones were left intact. And, and um, I think um, they are the legacy that we have in our current constitution. Um, comparatively, if you look at that and compare to other African uh, constitutions, many, many of them will not have that. But uh, we have uh, several components of um, uh, these um, cultural imperatives and principles and provisions in the constitution that are remaining intact. Thank you very much, Zin. And I think I, I wanted us to go through that history. And I think it's really important that you've given it to us because what comes through to me is this tension between um, the people, what the people want in many different ways, not just in terms of content, but in terms of process. And then the tension with it being taken away, whether it is through the politicians or through the professionals, in this case, the lawyers. And so we constantly have that um, tug between. And I think it's, it's a tug of war that we continue to see today. And often when you hear people talking today about what's wrong with Kenya, we keep getting back to that question of our problem is, is, is that we have a bad culture, we have an immoral culture, or you know Kenyans are just bad, that's the way we live. So I thought it was really important for us to, to go through that. I want to go to, um, to some of the questions, and I think a number of those questions will actually lay the ground for, for where we want to go. But let me just, um, let's, let's just connect with what people are saying. Um, Obia Bero Diambo, and I think you have addressed this, had, had, had asked about where we place um, this, this term African culture. And he made the point that um, culture, and in, in his opinion, is an expression of a homogeneous community that Africa is not. And so when we talk about um, Africa as if it is indivisible, that this is problematic. Um, John uh, Mukeni made the um, observation, listening to you, that is this where the rain started to beat with us, with the British presence here, or else, um, um, uh, and then he was looking in terms of culture and how that has continued to affect us all the way um, to the present. Obi also asked us if the understanding of, quote, Kenyan people, premises on Kenya as a geographic entity or an abstract. Was there an understanding whether those born or those who live or those who belong um, to different ethnicities associated with Kenya, um, what, what, you know, how do we relate with this? And what was the concept of, actually when we say Kenya, what was the concept of Kenya um, that we are, are, are thinking through there? I wonder if you wanted to just comment on any of those three before I, 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 I put a couple of other questions together. Um, let, let, me, let me start answering all the three in, in a roundabout way. Mm -hmm. So um, some of these questions obviously came up. Yeah. And um, when they came up, um, majority of the people who made submissions to the Constitution of Kenya Review Commission and the, to the Committee of Experts made um, several um, uh, proposals um, to the process and in the processing of them at some point for example we came um, people wanted um, all communities of Kenya to be named 
Mm -hmm. Kenyans were saying that uh, these mythical 42 communities, um, uh, 41 communities plus a category called other, is not uh, true. And, and uh, I'm pointing this out because it, it creates a dilemma, that the kind of dilemma Obi is talking about, because it's, it's, it's a conceptualization issue. Yeah. Um, so the conference, um, people made recommendations, and they even tried to list those communities. And of course, there were already disputes about, does it uh, exist, or is this um, group uh, distinct from this group, and so on. But the consensus in the end, if you look at the cultural report, the report of the cultural ad hoc committee at the National Constitutional Conference, at the end, it has a schedule which has names of communities. Mm -hmm. But after long deliberations, people agreed and said, no, you see, let us not name them for the following reasons. The first one, who says we are all of us here competent to name these communities? What if we name and put in the constitution and then people come up and say, you left us out? So we said, that is one of the problem. The second problem is, it should be people who define themselves. Okay? Um, and not the state or other people being defining them. So there is um, a community um, in Kenya that was labeled by the British Malakote, meaning vagabonds, mm. people who are, like to roam around aimlessly. Okay. And, and yeah, and, and if you ask them, they say, no, that is not our name. Thirdly, we understood in the sense of what uh, Professor Gott was talking about, that uh, social interaction and social processes can give birth to new communities. And um, uh, communities that were given examples as, as Wataveta, um, communities like Waluya, um, communities like Kalenji, they didn't exist. They became social constructs. As I said, look, let us agree on a process that will allow for recognitions of Kenyan communities. Not some state officer sitting somewhere to make um, choices based on discretion, but establish an institutional framework. That is why that culture, um, the cultural uh, uh, um, chapter, established a culture of a commission on culture. And that will be a constitutional commission. Now, in the absence of that, people are saying that parliament shall make legislation. But as somebody has already noted, that this legislative agenda is very slow. And that sometimes it is conceptualized in contradiction to the constitution. In other words, the constitution is much more progressive and the legislative structure is less progressive. And one of the reasons that is so is because people were trained to think in legal, le British legal system thinking. It's very difficult for them to conceptualize how culture then become an important national process or concept or imperative. So again, maybe those who are working in the cultural sectors like ourselves, we have dropped the ball because we needed to provide leadership on this. But secondly, that the question of should it be limited to boundaries created by the British um, called Kenya? <laughs> that was a big debate. But the majority and the consensus was that we should not go the Ethiopian way and say provide for a mechanism for self-determination. We who are storytellers know that one of the rules of storytelling is that if you start with um, an interdiction, there will always be a violation. In other words, if you provide for a mechanism for self-determination, it will be used at some point. Somebody will say, let's use it, it's there. Why, why is it there if it's not for using? But in lieu of that, they said, okay, let's balance that with 
a devolved system of government that will allow for autonomy of various regions, various geographical spaces in Kenya to be able to make determinations of issues that make fundamental impact on their lives. So the, the principle of subsidiarity, in other words, people making decisions where it affects them directly was then ingrained in the constitution. And it was hoped then by allowing for autonomy, by allowing for equality, by allowing for equity, then we will be able to live together. But those who are saying that undermine the principle of equality, undermine the principle of equity, undermine the principle of devolution, undermine the principle of inclusion, then those are the ones who are the ones who are re renewing the debate of saying, maybe should, we should also have a provision for self-determination. And in this debate of um, resource allocation, that has come up again and again. And I've seen somebody already making reference to that. And then lastly, in terms of saying, um, what do we do with this? Let's remember what we were saying, that culture is not static. Culture is dynamic. Culture can change. Culture can grow. And that values that we are seeking to enhance are hoped for at the individual level. Somebody will have a choice in terms of what culture they want to partake. What cultural life do they want to manifest themselves? At the family level, the same applies. At the community level, it applies the same way. And then at the national level, this is where social engineering is required. Because we have provided a template of national values, not only in Article 10 of our constitution, but in every substantive culture uh, chapter, substantive, with the exception of maybe three, <clears throat> you have a situation where you have values and principles. So we start with values and principles. And we are then hoping that with those cultural imperatives and values that have been provided for in the constitution, and we had hoped an institutional base, which was uh, in the chapter, which was taken away, we, were hope, we are now supposed to work to establish a culture commission or mechanism of some sort of implementing these values. So that when we then grow these values and implement them and embrace them and leave them, then they become the Kenyan values. So I hope in, in, in that long winded way, I have answered some of these uh, three questions. I think you've answered some of the questions and they continue to come. And so we'll keep coming back to some of them. Just quickly going through the questions. I think we have two sets of questions. There's a whole set of sets of questions that have to deal with what's the way forward. And, and, and some of them in that case are looking at what's going on in the present. Um, saying that, okay, we hear what you're saying about the constitution, but when we look at our reality, we are seeing something different, whether it is abused by the state or we need to think a little bit more about certain areas where, you know what you said, some things were taken back and we need to figure out how to bring them on board. However, I, I, I have a couple of questions that really take us to what does the constitution say apart from Article 11? that has to do with, 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 with culture. So I'm going to read a couple of those questions and then just ask you if you could take us through what does the constitution say, especially bearing in mind um, this particular set of questions. Um, Kimani Njogu is wondering if you could comment on, 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 on Kiswahili as the language of creating the nation. And we know that the constitution actually specifically speaks to the question of language and the question of, of, of Kiswahili in particular. And he also asks, he says, thank you Zane for this um, very um, this very vital uh, journal that you're giving us. Um, and then he, he asks, especially in relation to devolution, should legislation on culture be handled by the Senate or should it be handled by the National um, Assembly? And Stine in Joroge, and I think here we're also talking about in terms of what institutions and how do we bring culture um, to life, asks if culture is such an integral part 
of the heart of our constitution, how come the ministry is relegated to matters that pertain to social services, gender, sports, or national um, heritage? So I'm wondering if we can use those three questions as a basis to just talk about what does the constitution actually say about culture? And you've, you've alluded to some of that. And then we can come to the questions on what can we do or what, what needs to be done, what you know, questions to do with BBI and, and so on and so forth. But what does the constitution say? Okay, so I, I, um, if we started going uh, article by article, it become longer than we, we have time for. So what I'll try and do is to do a sketch map. It's a mapping exercise in terms of principle setting. So the first one is that um, we start with the preamble. And in the preamble, there are certain ideas, cultural ideas. So for example, um, we admit that we are a nation of many communities. Uh, for the first time, we, we admit that. Um, this is the departure from the colonial trying to, to straight jacket us and make us uh, individuals. And we say, we, we accept our diversity and we celebrate this diversity, right? And we seek to work together to build one nation and with the appreciation of all these uh, diversities. So one of the principle of the cultural imperative is that appreciation. First admission that we are a nation of many communities and many diversities. And secondly, that we appreciate all of them. And that thirdly, the value that we are going to work to live together, to live together. Then in the same preamble, there's the idea that there are people who struggle for justice beef in, in the past. Again, this is a cultural idea, that there are values of uh, people who struggle to change a system that is unjust to a system that is just, and we celebrate them. We also celebrate the heritage of our nation and our environment. And then we make a commitment, again, this is common to most cultures, because it's, it is the essence of perpetuation of culture, that we are trustees on behalf of generations yet to come. And that we will do the best that we can to protect the interest of generations that are yet to be born and yet to, to come. And that we are also understanding this idea of being trustees, more guardians. So if you, if you start deconstructing the, the preamble itself, it is, it is loaded with cultural imperatives. Then the first article of our constitution, which I made a reference to, which is the sovereignty of the people, it's the people who should decide. It's the people who are important. It's not individuals, it's not leaders, it's the people. But if you then consider what then happens next, after saying uh, the sovereignty of the people, the supremacy of the constitution, and the defense of the constitution, then we go to define who these people are in terms of saying, establishing the Republic and defining what kind of Republic do we want to establish? Republic that has language. And on the question of language, people look at it in a restrictive term. First of all, it's, it's a Republic that has values. So in Article 10, we have established national values in the Republic. So we have established values for the Republic and then under the Republic, we also establish symbols and, and um, other binding features of culture. And uh, one of them, of course, is language. So what have we provided for in the language? First of all, is the, the highest honor is then bestowed to Kiswahili. Why is the highest honor bestowed to Kiswahili? Because then it has dual, dual uh, 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 primacy. It is both our national language and the only one. That's the only lang national language. And uh, we've said it's a national language, it's an African language. It is that which binds us together. So it, it has the highest honor of being our national language. 
in the past a national lang uh, the language was Kiswahili but it did not have the second owner which is it also an official language together with English it's an official language together with English and Kenyan sign language so again you have expanded already there the idea of what are official languages so there are three official languages Kiswahili English and Kenyan sign language and already you have expanded by sign language by saying um, uh, uh, people with disability of this kind can also have a, a, an, an official language that they understand it's not just sign language it's Kenyan sign language there's a difference and then we have also brought Braille later on in the in the same in the Bill of Rights. But there is another honor that is given to all Kenyan languages. This is for the first time a reference to Kenyan languages. And why are languages important? Languages are not the only means of communication and transmission of ideas or messaging and coding and encoding and, and decoding uh, messages. Languages are also re repositories of wisdom, collective wisdom. They are repositories of education, of science, of technology, of history, of record, of memory. So if, if you go back to Ngugi's argument about language and how language can be used to oppress or to liberate, this is an act of liberation. So that is part of the Republic. And then within the Republic, we also define what are national symbols. And then if you go, you'll be made reference to the schedules, you'll find the flag, you'll find the national anthem, you'll find, and the national anthem both in English and Kiswahili. So let me mix this, this provision with some of the challenges that already people are pointing out. 10 years down the line, we don't have a Kiswahili version of the constitution. 10 years. 10 years down the line, you cannot receive full government services in Kiswahili. Because there are some forms that are not yet in both. They have, they have tried. Many forms now have both in English and Kiswahili for the ones applying for passport, for ID, for a number of things they are. But there are some forms that are still only in English. But also, government services, so there are some places you go and you speak Kiswahili, it becomes a problem of communication. What we were looking out for was a path of development that government will then establish on how to make sure that the state comply with this requirement of language. What do I mean? An example is Canada. Canada has duality of um, two languages that are formal, um, formal languages, his, in, uh, English and French. And you cannot serve in the public service in Canada if you can't speak both. Although French is only predominantly used in one province, but you must have both. In Kenya, that must become our aim to make sure that the status given to language, Kiswahili, particularly as a national language and as a formal language, is actually then implemented. But after the Republic, then we define citizenship. Okay, and then within that, we had um, challenges in terms of um, equality of citizenship and so on. So you go on and you go to the Bill of Rights and you find rights there that have to do with culture. But let me back up a little bit and say uh, three things. One, that the challenge that we are being told, how come the government is still having Ministry of Culture and this, and Gender and this, Ministry of Heritage and this, and so on. When we talk about that, what is the problem? The problem is the mindset. The problem is not the constitution. 
In other words, what we are saying is that those people who were there in the past system of governance are replicating the past system of govern, government as if there is, the constitution has never been changed. During uh, the time of Moi, when we had the old constitution, there was a ministry of women, gender, and uh, culture and fused together and sports. They're still doing the same thing. In other words, there is lack of imagination. Again, this is a cultural imperative. And two, lack of change of mindset. And three, that our legislative structures are still captured in the old system. But then the question is, we who are in the cultural sector, what have we done to change this mindset? The second aspect I wanted to raise is the question of when we are defining the republic, this is where you now come across that famous article 11, which talks about the cumulative civilization. And you know, um, the choice of words were very careful then that done. When you talk about cumulative and you talk about civilization, what is the difference between civilization and culture? Civilization is the highest um, attainment of social cultural development. And it is a statement by <coughs> Kenyans that we had the, our own civilizations and we honor those civilizations. And those civilizations are the cornerstone of our being, of our sense of belonging. And based on that architecture, it gives us the lenses of going forward in future struggles by saying, first of all, acknowledging who we are and where we're coming from. And we do not want to get into this debate. Did you, did, did, were there civilizations before the arrival of the other or before discovery? We say that it is a constitutional principle. Yes, there were civilizations. Cumulative in the sense of one generation passing to the next, this generation passing to the future. And I made already the, the, the aspiration in the, in the uh, preamble of saying we are trustees and we want to uphold the interest of those who are not yet even born. Why is this important? It's important because now for the first time have we not only we, we cannot recognize the languages of Kenya without recognizing the communities of Kenya. So let me go forward and then touch on a few others because I know time, time um, is going. One is that people may think that um, um, chapter like um, environment and the chapter on land uh, have no cultural components. So the constitution review processes benefited a great deal from um, the knowledge and experience of uh, the late uh, Professor Okotho Gendo. Professor Okotho Gendo was not only a land expert, but he was also one of the people who had researched greatly on um, traditional land tenure systems. In other words, land tenure systems of very many different African communities or Kenyan communities in Kenya. And he knew the distinction between those. And in one of his scholar, uh, 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 scholarly work, uh, The Tenants of the, Crown, uh, of the Crown, he analyzed the ideas of the British concerning land and um, uh, in, on, in their own country and how they conceptualize land in Kenya. And the idea that um, Africans um, are not endowed enough to be responsible enough for their own destiny on their own land. And a large, large component of land that was categorized as owned by the communities in Kenya became what was called trust land. And um, that land which became trust land was then placed at the, at, at, at the hands of the crown to be administered on behalf of those people. 
Later on, it became in the hands of the prime minister and then the president. And we know how much the crown abused that power and how much previous presidents abused that power. So in this constitution, <clears throat> there are only three categories of land that are recognized. One, private land. Two, government land. And three, community land. And we had great debate of people who wanted to say there should be no category at all. Land should be collectively owned by all Kenyans. And of course, the majority of the people opposed that idea. They were not ready for that idea. So the transformation of this to return community land or trust land back to the ownership of communities. And one of the classification of defining a community land is ethnic identity. So the connection between identity and land is already there. And some of these are now administered by county governments. Do they understand that they have become trustees? I don't know. Are they abusing this right? Absolutely. Many of the lands that are now coming, their, their tenure is expiring. Uh, people want to use shortcuts and not involve the people. It was deliberately, deliberately done in that way. The land that was under lease, lease ownership. We had situations where you had land, somebody owning with a lease of 999 years. That is 1,000 years minus one. How many generations are those? So again, a debate was to say, should we completely remove all these lands, leases, um, with other examples of Zimbabwe and other countries? Majority of the people did not want that. Should we reduce it to 50 years? Majority of people say that is also unfair. Then the question came up, what is fair for now? It's 99 years. And some of those years have expired. That is why you have big companies that will own, uh, uh, hold leases of trucks and trucks of land are now busy trying to change the constitution so that they can have the same old uh, procedures of owning or leasing land. And ideally, that land that has gone to community, if you want to lease it, then there should be negotiations between you and the community. The people, the county government, and you who want to lease. And the people might decide, no, we don't want to lease it. We want to, to redistribute it. Again, the question of ownership of land and size of land came up. And the majority of people, Kenyan said, it is not fair for people to own thousands of acres and others to own nothing. And uh, people are not uh, adventurous enough to put the limit in the constitution. And the reason given was, that it will be very difficult to change. You'd rather then say, Parliament shall enact a law to establish ceilings of ownership. To date, to date Parliament has not enacted such a law. So I'm, I'm comparing, I'm, I'm trying to show you some of these as aspects, but let me very quickly mention a few others. Uh, one, uh, of course, uh, in the Bill of Rights, there are several rights uh, in relation to culture, in, in relation to um, people benefiting from their heritage and material culture, uh, um, uh, having um, ownership of um, creativity, um, language is protected, uh, information is protected, uh, the right to associate is protected. You may not think it is directly related. The right of visitation is protected, historical vis visitation. But also the right of establishing alternative conflict resolution mechanisms. And we, here we, we had in mind that there are cultural conflict resolution mechanisms. But having said that, let me say three things and then allow for more interaction. One, we agreed that all the cultural 
imperatives and things that are allowed by the constitution shall be guided by the values of the constitution. In other words, any cultural practices or values that are in contradiction of the constitution, they'll be void to that extent of contradiction. And this provision was put there admitting that there are some retrogressive aspects of certain cultures. Certain cultures cannot, we cannot wait for cultural processes to weed out oppressive or discriminatory um, uh, practices. We have outlawed them. Those, those which are not in conformity with the values and architecture and design of, and provisions of this constitution. Secondly, that we are expecting in future, a lot of work will be done now to bring some of these cultural provisions in the constitution to into practice and into implementation. And then thirdly, some of the challenges that we're facing. So if you look at, for example, the framework of implementing the constitution, we established a constitutional implementation commission that had um, a lifespan, a finite lifespan, and the possibility of extending its term. <coughs> Parliament, in, in its wisdom, or lack of it in our opinion, they decided to um, not renew the term of the Implementation Commission fairly early, and the Constitution has not been implemented fully. Secondly, there is reluctance among politicians to implement this Constitution with fidelity. Um, and they have been violating this constitution um, with impunity. Therefore, if they are violating all aspects of the constitution, you'll expect also the provisions on culture to be violated as well. And the social engineering and the imagination that is required to build a national culture based on the constitutional base of values established by this constitution has not happened at all, at all. And that uh, begs the question, whose responsibility is it? And uh, that Dr. Mshai, you made reference to Article 3 of our Constitution, which in part deals with the question of upholding, respecting, and, and um, um, obeying the Constitution. But the second part is to protect that Constitution. So every time people are talking about protection of the constitution, we are not thinking of protecting the cultural um, uh, aspects of this constitution. Um, and lastly, I think uh, lack of knowledge is dangerous because uh, not very many people know this cultural base of this Kenyan constitution and its liberative um, and transformative uh, potential. And if people knew, then we may have found um, interesting ways of seeking to implement and to make those uh, provisions come alive. I absolutely agree. And I'm really grateful to you for giving us such a good basis to keep up these conversations going. We do have quite a number of questions. So I'm going to, what I'm going to do is going to group them and so that we can hopefully get through all of them before we have to um, wrap up within about half an hour's time. Um, and, and some of it touches on what you're saying. I know you weren't able to go through the full constitution, but let me start with John Mukeni, who has, whose questions have to do really with the question of resources. Um, and one of his questions, for example, is how can cultural leadership help to stop intersectional inequalities of our people? And another question is just I'm referring to the re revenue allocation debate that's happening at the moment. And he, he notes that um, he does not see any allocation or, or, or of culture. But I wonder if you could just say something to do with inequalities, to do with um, revenue allocation, especially the fact that, um, and we know this, that the state never seems to have any money for culture. I think you need to unmute. Sorry. Sorry. Um, the first one is that the Constitution um, establishes the principle of equality or not only individuals, but all communities. But we, we come from a Kenya with a history. Um, uh, this history where there are those who 
wanted to inherit the privilege of um, colonial forces and white privilege to be transformed in um, community uh, privilege. And this will be associated with the president, the person who has enormous powers and the community of, from which the president comes from would want to claim to have special status and to be more equal than others. That is part of the history. So the first equalizing uh, principle is that all communities will be treated equally. But because we have admitted that we come from a history of marginalization, a history of exclusion, a history of um, exploitation, we also included the principle of equity. And in this principle of equity, we talked about um, bringing into national discourse, but also national participation of regions, of communities that suffered marginalization in the past. In other words, we have a duality of things that we want to do. One is to treat everybody equally, but also take into account that not everyone was treated equally in the past or can be treated in the future except through the constitution where we establish an equalization um, uh, process. Why am I saying it's an equalization process? Because some, some people talk about equalization fund. Equalization fund is only one aspect. There are three broad aspects in terms of equalization. If you look at the Bill of Rights, you'll keep on hearing when we talk about, for example, women, for minorities, for my marginalized communities, for people with disability, for youth, will say the state shall put in place administrative, uh, legislative, and other measures to address past inequalities. So again, as a, as a nation, we have failed to put this in place. Administrative, legislative, and other measures in making sure that everybody then um, is given equal opportunity. And those who are left behind are given extra resources to bring them to the same level as others. Secondly, the reference of um, resource allocation, a lot of people are talking about a formula. There's no formula in the constitution. The constitution make reference to basis, a basis. A basis, a basis again is a process. You take into account um, the circumstances, you, you take into account levels of poverty, you take into account um, levels of um, uh, uh, um, inequality in terms of um, provisions of social services, health, education, um, um, and other social services, uh, roads, network, and so on. So if you were to look at all these um, um, various components, then that is what forms the basis. But the third um, component is that devolution um, has been given um, functions. And in the constitution, the functions are established through a principle that finance follows functions. This, this is a principle established in the devolution chapter and in the public finance chapter. But yet we have not implemented that. And then lastly, and not least, the constitution, when you talk about um, provisions of what is the rightful share, the constitution establishes two parameters. The first one is that not less than 15%. Now, <laughs> this is what people call the flow. In other words, you can't go below 15%. But it doesn't put a ceiling. It establishes a principle of flow, but not establish a principle of ceiling. So you, you, you could even go to 95% being distributed. 
to the county governments. 95% you could, you could uh, do that. Why? Because in the functions that are allocated, largely the functions of national government are standard setting, policy directing, and not implementation, with the exception of functions that are not devolved. So even the functions that are not devolved are not getting their fair share. So the judiciary is not, is the judiciary function is not devolved, but the judiciary is still complaining. It's not getting its fair share. And the national government take the approach that they are charitable by giving a uh, county government more than 15%. So in this discussion, it is disingenuous to think that the national government is the one who have been given these resources. Don't forget what we said. Finance follows functions. So if finance was following functions, the large share or the lion's share would then be given to county governments. And last but not least, those who are obs obsessed with this equalization fund, the equalization fund is half a percent of, of the budget. Half a percent. So it won't make big difference and you start saying, oh, let us, <coughs> let us uh, not do right by the, the main sharing mechanism uh, uh, basis and uh, leave it to the half a percent. Um, that, that is unconstitutional, in my opinion. I don't know if that covers that, that particular question of resource allocation. I think that does. Thank you very much. Um, I, a couple of questions, other questions. Michael Karinga. Um, says, are there forces that are actively trying to engineer Kenyan contemporary culture? What are they? And then Razna, in much the same vein, um, notes that the, the, the government seems to have a very static view of culture. And, 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 and you know, every Jamuri day we see ethnic dances, and many of those dances have not evolved since 1963. So she asked, when culture is reduced to tribal dances or choirs devoted to extolling the virtues of the president, how can we as a nation promote culture and the arts which are dynamic, context-driven, and quite often supported by the state? And I want to add to that Tin Injoroge's question. He notes that um, we, the, the culture policy, uh, we still don't really have a culture, we, actually we don't have a culture policy, 57 years on after independence, and what is the best way forward? So can you talk a little bit about culture and the arts? I know we're running out of time, but just very quickly, um, those three questions. I think the major problem is those who are in culture and understand culture are not in policy. Mm. And those who are in policy have no clue about culture. So they think um, culture is uh, hiring praise singers. Mm -hmm. um, culture is a museum piece of clothing people in size of skirts to come and um, jiggle their, their feet while somebody is hurrying them along as if they are herd of cattle. So that is where the dilemma is. And I think um, in, in, in terms of making progress, I think we who are in culture, and um, my brother Obio Birodiambo will remember that he, he, he and their friends tried to establish a place where um, people in culture will also explore ways of saying, how do we influence uh, policy? The reason we were so many of us who are cultural practitioners in the original CKRC is because we deliberately wanted to <coughs> participate in that. And the Mizizi Cultural Center, headed by Obi Virodiambo then, uh, invited Professor Osaga Odak for an earlier conversation and saying, if we were to write a Kenyan constitution using cultural lenses, how will we do it? That presentation is amazing. I hope um, Obi and others can, can uh, digitize that presentation and put it back in line. And based on that con conversation, we then had a strategic meeting with uh, Kangara Jambi, Obi Diambo, Kimani Wawanjiru, Professor Kimani Njogo, others, a lot of us, and said, how best can we influence the constitution making process? And we said, we must be on the table. We must be in the process. So at any given opportunity, we brought cultural workers on board, including in making 
uh, sure that the, the process is consultative. We got Professor Kimani Njogu and his team to do translation of most of those documentations into, into Kiswahili. And, and Kenyan could access both documentations of the constitution making process in Kiswahili and in, in, in English. So that expanded expansion. So it's a challenge to us who are committed to um, making this constitution come alive. It's a challenge to us. Secondly, we must uh, seek to transform government. There's no, there no choice about that. Um, like uh, Barack Obama said, there is no distinction between activism and mobilization and organizing in the community and leaving politics to politicians. If you leave politics to politicians, that's, the outcome will be the same. If you leave the so-called technocrats who have no clue about culture, um, then, then you have the same problem. So in other words, we must roll up our sleeves. We must ensure that the civic education program that is ongoing, has been going on for the last 20, 30 years, has a cultural component. Let me give you an example. When we started um, as, as, as um, activists and cultural workers, rejecting the idea that um, there are a few individuals who monopolized the idea that they're the ones who fought for independence. People started the idea of rejection of um, naming individuals after national struggles or processes. Based on those struggles from RPP days, that is what led to the transformation of Kenyatta Day into Mashuja Day in our constitution. So you can actually show a direct a relationship between struggle and outcome and between conceptualization and implementation. So we dropped the ball after the constitution was enacted because we thought of the following. One, people, some people were tired. They said, we struggled so much, we have now gotten it. And uh, there was a sense that there was a promise that the constitution once adopted will fix all our problems. It will be a panacea for all our problems. That was a wrong assumption. That has a wrong hope to give the people. Secondly, some people thought the constitution is self-executing. It's not. It needs good men and women committed to change and transformation, dedicating their lives to working hard to implement and bring into life the provisions that have been uh, provided for and the promise that has been made in this constitution. But thirdly, there, is, uh, there was a creeping idea that we have made so much progress, reversal is not pro uh, possible. But these 10 years have shown us, have shown us reversible, reversals is serious. Uh, non-compliance to the constitution is a serious problem. Lack of fidelity in the implementation of the constitution is a serious problem. So we need to get back into the trenches like we are doing now and say, how do we do this? And then lastly, research is, in, is critical. Creativity and creation is critical. And, and making sure what we research on and what we create has large accessibility to the people of Kenya. And there is a whole generation of Kenyans who do not know the history of struggle. We have a challenge of legacy. In other words, how does one generation bequeath the next generation the power, the know-how, and the commitment for resistance and for protecting what we have already gained and for creating more opportunities for growth. So I hope that answers broadly in terms of principles that those set of questions. Thank you very much. And um, yes, I think, I think you, 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 start, you, you take us into now thinking about so many things. Um, something that's on the table, and I know it's a little bit difficult to talk about because we actually do not have the BBI proposals right now. But um, there are all sorts of conversations. And, and Razna Wara is curious 
that you know one of the proposals that we hear about is that um, the BBI has um, um, advocates for a national historian. And so she wonders what your thoughts would be um, on, on that, given that those who write history are often the victors. I'm wondering, is this a necessary position? How does it compensate for the fact that history um, has been downgraded from the school syllabus? So really, what do we do with this question of a national history in relation um, to culture? Um, John McKenney has asked about the question of cultural centers. So if we're thinking about institutions, education institutions, the fact that we should have cultural centers and what you think about that. And then I just wanted to tie that to Betty Okero is, um, I guess, wondering aloud, how do we reconcile our sovereignty and the current overreach by the political elite in terms of hijacking our katiba, using our and so how do we, uh, you know, is it possible to use our power through the popular, quote, popular BBI to rewrite our governance culture, values, and individual rights? So questions about the possibility of the, um, changing the constitution through BBI, but also questions about um, institutions of culture, both education and then that question of cultural centers. Okay, so, so, let's, start, so let's start with the question of official historian. I think, um, okay, before I go into it, I say um, we are discussing this based on what they published and not what they are yet to publish as BBI. So they published this idea of creating a position of um, a national historian. That's a very bad idea. In fact, it is contrary to the architecture of the constitution and the principle of sovereignty of the people the principle of um, 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 uh, independence of conscience, of, of freedom of association, um, freedom of um, 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 acquiring ideas and so on. We had this kind of thing during the Kano era and the first um, years of independence. Uh, people who wanted to capture um, the imagination of the nation by telling um, lopsided, sometimes complete falsehoods about our history. And the danger of establishing a custodian, one center of knowledge about what our history is about, is that that will be a state version of the history. And the state version will be of that person. So we must learn from our mistakes. And my question is, the Constitution had provided for a commission an independent constitutional commission. That the same politicians were rejecting, but now they want an individual who can be controlled. Um, we had hoped to establish uh, constitutional commissions uh, to do three things. One, to protect the sovereignty of the people. Two, to protect the constitution. And three, to promote it. Um, those uh, constitutional commission and independent offices majority, almost all of them, have been captured by the state. And none of them is doing the functions that they were supposed to. People are just um, seeking appointment. They get into these commissions. They go through the motions of doing PR for government, and their salaries and allowances, and uh, stay there for five years, and then leave. So we've learned um, state has designed to capture independent institutions. So again, an individualization of memory is a bad idea in Kenya, absolutely bad idea. Um, the second one is um, how do we um, leverage this principle of sovereignty of the people? <clears throat> people forget the conceptualization of that um, sovereignty of the people. The first position is that the people exercise their sovereignty directly. How do they do this? Actually, we have constitutionalized mass action. What, what does the constitution say? That you can demonstrate, you can, you can assemble, you can demonstrate, you can even picket. Picketing and demonstration are not the same. Picketing is much more robust, that you can even uh, close a particular office and no one can come in or go out. So mass action, which was illegal in the past, but Anyway, we carried out mass action to bring change to Kenya is now legal. It's part of our constitutional framework. You can boycott, you can strike. You know, 
as long as it's done peacefully and within the, the constitution. So we can, we can even boycott um, um, uh, goods and services. We can do many things. Also direct um, participation includes uh, participation in referendum, participation in elections. I know some people who are so frustrated, they, they are even giving up on um, elections. And personally, I think that would be a mistake. Um, uh, uh, we should learn from our people who came before us and say, you should participate in all spheres of influence. Everywhere there is influence, you should seek to be there, to be counted so that you can participate. In terms of cultural centers, yes, this is a good idea, but let's not forget culture is mainly, is always shared, but it's mainly the large portion of culture is devolved. So we need to hold um, county governments accountable for how to implement this um, idea of, um, of culture. So it is absolutely critical in terms of saying um, these cultural centers should be established on the right uh, paradigm and on the right framework. So they do not become what we have say, already said, something that we, we reject totally, that um, uh, it is um, a cultural piece or it's a museum or people dressed in funny costumes, including SISO. So the idea of cultural centers, if they are based on the constitutional imperatives, it's a very good idea. So I've covered all the three in terms of uh, memory and history, in terms of centers, and in terms of sovereignty. Okay, we're coming to an end, and, and there are still so many questions. Um, and so I want to just try and, um, as, as you know, as you start um, thinking of winding down, one, a lot of the questions have to do with what can we do? Um, for instance, development through media has asked, how do we engage the public to make them see culture as envisioned by the Kenyan constitution? Um, there are other questions. Um, um, Obi Obiero Diambo has um, wondered if you could just mention something as we come to a close on, on, on integrity um, and chapter six and, what, and, and the link between values, ethics, and 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 culture um and then there are i think a lot of comments about how we think about culture what are some of the struggles that we have to do with culture um and and what is the best way forward you know we, we are as we think about okay now that we know all this about culture we want to move ahead we want to bring the people with us <laughs> we want to use culture as a foundation how would you propose we go about that i think um there are many great ideas in some of the comments that have been given. But also the, the first one we start is to admit to ourselves that we, uh, those who came before us and those who are here with us now uh, operated under much more restrictive uh, environment and atmosphere and a single party dictatorship. And uh, even then we were able to use culture. So culture was used during the independence struggle Culture was used during the, the, the struggle for introduction of multipartism and um, democracy in the country. And culture was used in the constitutional making process. And culture, culture can also still be used in the constitution um, implementation. Um, uh, my brother, Obi Obi I, I, I shouldn't even be reminding you um, um, the performance of um, uh, drum beats on Kerenyaga. Uh, with or without a license, or, or some of the plays that were considered to be um, uh, seditious. Um, um, the trial of Deda Kimathi, um, Dario Fo's plays, Can't Pay, Won't Pay, The Accidental Death of an Anarchist, and many other Kenyan written plays, which were um, uh, um, considered to be um, anti-state and therefore banned, and people still continue performing them under trees and so on. Music. Um, during these struggles had played a, an important role. We see a lot more of cinema and fashion and so on. But let me, let me go back into the opportunities that exist under this constitution that we have not particularly used. So for, for instance, going forward, um, every time people use uh, strategic um, uh, public interest litigation, it has never been about culture. That's an avenue we can, we can use. Um, 
an avenue of proposing and even go through the development of policy. Instead of waiting for policy to come from the ministry, sit ourselves and draft the same way we did at the People's Commission of Kenya. <laughs> the same way we did at Ufungamano before that. The same way we did at five C's and four C's before that. So we many of the many of the provisions of the constitution were not developed through formal structures. First, they were developed through informal structures, and then they were tested when we got people to participate in them. So pro providing the leadership, one of the missing components in the implementation of the constitution is imagination. There is lack of imagination in implementing devolution. Many of the leaders who are in devolution think devolution is enhanced uh, uh, um, uh, former um, decentralized system of uh, local government. It is not. It is based on the sovereignty of the people. Because we are saying sovereignty shall be exercised at both national and county level. So lack of imagination is our problem, isn't it? So the artists, the cultural workers have not done the imagining. We have also not done the un, un bundling and packaging and raveling of what is contained in the constitution. But in terms of saying, do we have baby steps? If you look at the work that is being done by Mwali Mukimani Njogu at Twaweza, for instance, with the magazine that they have. They have been consistent on this. If you look at what uh, Zaid Rajan is doing um, with Awaz and other places, they have been at work at this. If you look at the work of young artists in music, in drama, in film, they have been at work at this. So what we need is to bring together one, a level of awareness of the potential of the power that can be unleashed by implementing the cultural components of this constitution. Two, we need to get organizing. And this, this is important. The two components of mobilizing and organizing are critical. We must organize as a sector, as a community, as peoples of this country, and start implementing. We should not wait for somebody else to come and implement for us. But also we need to, to roll our sleeves and dirty our hands in politics, if, 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 if I may say so. Because if we are saying the political operators are the ones who are the biggest barrier to the realization of this constitution, then we must get it to that kitchen. We must. They, we are the many, as one scholar said, we are the many, they are the few. So how come the few are the ones who are determining the destiny of the many? We must get organized. The only difference between them and us, the few who are um, purveyors of impunity, those who are insistent on the status quo and returning us to the, to the bad days, to them it's the good old days. They are very few, they are minute few. The only difference between them and us is that they are better organized. They are better mobilized. They better coordinate among themselves. That is, that's a difference. And then the last two things, one that um, we forget that um, the contribution of cultural related industries is the largest component of our economy. And we don't see it that way. We must start leveraging that and making a connection and, and, um, and drawing uh, the attention of the Kenyans, how much fashion, food industry, film, uh, theater, uh, uh, tourism, um, and, and so on and so on. How, how much does it contribute? Publishing, how much does it uh, uh, contribute to, um, to, to um, the national um, e e economy? And then the most dangerous and most uh, challenging um, uh, things that face us, which is behavior change. Again, that is the domain of cultural workers. Thank you very much. I know that Terry, we have expanded and uh, completed our time allocated, but thank you very much. No, I want to thank you, Zane. That has been just so amazing. I think 
you know, um, somebody asked me yesterday, like, we're going to speak for two whole hours on culture. What is there to say? And I think you have shown that we could have continued talking about this for several other hours. I think the best way of, of, of thanking you is just to quote what some of the participants have said. Kawive has um, dubbed you a walking culture psychopedia. And, you know, because you seem to just carry so much and says congrats and thank you. Um, uh, Sheila Masinde uh, reflects, she says, well, in Zane, this is the kind of learning we need embedded in formal learning and civic education for us to get a better appreciation of constitutional practices. Perhaps a better understanding of this would help us to build um, a culture of integrity. Joy Mboya says that, thank you very much, Zane, for a most informative engagement, and notes that there was an essential link between the Pan-African political struggle for independence and the cultural right of the peoples of Africa and the African um, um, diaspora. And she goes on to talk about how the building of our African nations on the foundations of our culture was actually part of our independence um, and struggles. So thank you very, very much that um, we, we've been working on the constitutional re review process to redress this, and you have shown why it is so important for us to continue to do this. In, indeed, as I read what Joy has said, I, I remember Amical Cabral's um, words where he reminded us that um, national liberation is an act of culture, and that that is something that we, we often forget. As we close, I also do want to thank every single one of the participants. The chat is so rich, not only with questions, but with comments. And, and, and we really, um, I, I for one, I'm going to save that chat just to be able to continue to think through some of the things that have been said. Thank you very much for those who joined us on YouTube and, and, and Steenie in particular for sending us questions even from YouTube. I want to very much um, thank Inuka, who is holding the space for us, who has provided the space for us, for, the, for being the inspiration for the Nane Nane webinar series and working with so many other different um, um, partners to bring every single day of this week a conversation. As I mentioned yesterday, we talked about human rights and nationhood, um, led by Jedida Warohio um, and anchored by, by um, our brother Hussein Khalid. Tomorrow we'll be thinking about public participation and governance at both the county and national levels of government. Um, and Purity Jebor will be anchoring that, um, that conversation um, with Cornelius Odwar and Cyprian Nyamwamu speaking. On Thursday, we'll go on to look at the organization and function of the 48 governments. Um, um, and Regina Opondo will be um, hosting Shiro Gikonyo in that conversation. And then we come um, to an end of this particular series, the Nane Nane webinar series, on Friday, when Atsango Chesoni will be in conversation with Daisy Amdani on the politics of amendment to the Constitution. Once again, Abu Bakr Zain, thank you so, so much for catalyzing such a rich conversation, catalyzing our thoughts, and let's continue to not only think about what it means when we say culture is the foundation of the nation, but working to make it a reality. You can catch this conversation and all conversations if you have missed them or you want to go back and, 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 and think through them again on Nisisi, um, Kenya Nisisi, uh, Nisisi Kenya's YouTube platform. Looking forward to continuing this conversation tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much.